Hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is David Johnson, and I'm a partner at the law firm Pool Lawyers. This is our first ever live stream PL talk. Our PL Talks project is a passion project for our firm. Our goal is to talk with distinguished Alberta artists about their work and to raise an awareness of the talented artists that we have working in our beautiful province. We're excited to be able to continue these talks, even if we can't hold them in person right now. I know a lot of our viewers are working from home, from their homes today. We thought it would be appropriate to make you aware that in today's talk, there may be occasional discussion of adult themes in some language that isn't suitable for children. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see a comment window. Throughout the talk, please feel free to type any comments or questions you may have. We will be having a question and answer session at the end, so uh, we'll be getting to as many of your questions as we're able to. Uh, feel free to give it a test now, pop on to the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from, uh, or just say hi. Uh, I'm joined today by author Naomi K. Lewis. Originally from England, Naomi was raised near Washington, D.C. and in Ottawa before attending university at the University of New Brunswick and Carleton University, and eventually settling in Calgary. Naomi's work is wide ranging. She's written a novel titled Cricket in a, Cricket in a Fist, while attending university in my home province of New Brunswick. Her short story collect collection, I Know Who You Remind Me Of, was shortlisted for the Alberta Reader's Choice Award and the George Burnett, sorry, Bugnet Award for Fiction. It was the winner of the Great Plains Publications Cal Califon Prize for Fiction. She has ghostwritten several books, including a Canadian bestseller titled In Case of Fire, Please Remain Calm, Then Slowly Rebuild Your Life. To top it all off, She's written several nonfiction articles and essays and edited many more. Naomi's latest work, Tiny Lights for Travelers, is a memoir about her real life journey to retrace her grandfather's escape from Nazi occupied Europe in, during the Second World War. It's been shortlisted for the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction, the Pink Sea Given Family Prize for Nonfiction, the W.O. Mitchell City of Calgary Book Award and the Wilfred Eggleston Award for Nonfiction. It's been well received by critics. For myself, I can, I can confirm that it's a very captivating read. I'm honored to introduce to you today, Naomi K. Lewis. Naomi, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. Uh, I, I appreciate you taking uh, the time out of your schedule to join us virtually. Uh, and to talk about your book and your latest book and your work, especially in the middle of the pandemic we're all going through right now. Uh, I, ho I hope you and those close to you are doing well. We're all fine, thank you. How about you and those close to you? Doing well, doing well. The, the kids are going a little stir crazy some days, but you know, aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> Um, let's, let's talk about your book, Tiny Lights for Travelers. Uh, congratulations on your recent nominations. Uh, you. You, got, you got three new nominations in uh, quite short order. Uh, how do you feel about the attention that your book, Tiny Lights, has been getting lately? Well, I mean, of course, I love it. <laughs> and it's really, it really cheered me up to get those nominations recently um, when life is feeling so weird and uncertain. So it's nice to be... Uh, it's really, I'm just really glad that, that some people out there like my book. Obviously, um, that's what one hopes when writing something like this. And it takes so long um, and there's so much, so much doubt and then, you know, rejection and rewriting and rethinking. So the fact that it's come together in a way that people connect with is, is really nice. That's, that is good. It, and it's... Uh... You know, it, it's a very interesting story. Um, it, it's really two stories in one in a lot of ways. Um, because it, on the one hand, it's the story of your grandfather's escape um, in 1942. Uh, and on the other hand, it's your own personal story of retracing those steps over 70 years later. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how did this book come about? Well, it was a long, a lot of thinking before I wrote anything. Um, my parents found this journal that my grandfather had written, this 30 page journal, um, after long after his death actually, when my grandmother, who was a lot younger than him, um, 
was becoming ill and she needed to move into an assisted living facility. And my parents were moving, going through all her stuff and deciding what to keep and what to move with her and, and so on. And at the bottom of a box that they never had seen before, there was a whole bunch of documents like my parents, or my grandparents, you know, old passports and their, their marriage certificate and stuff like that. And in this box, there was also this pile of paper. So it was just 30 typed pages. Um, in Dutch and then also which was my grandfather's first language and then also 30 type pages in English which was a translation of the Dutch journal that he had either done himself presumably or had someone help him with um, and it was an account of this two week these two weeks that he had spent traveling in this July of 1942 from um, the Netherlands where he lived to southern France, Lyon, and which was at the time in um, unoccupied France. And then he, um, after that, I mean, we knew that, that he'd made this trip and then eventually ended up in England, but we never knew that he had like stopped for a while in France and written this account. And also we never really knew the details of his journey because he had been very reticent, like very reticent to talk about it at all. So. He never told my mother or my aunt, his other daughter, the details of this. So my sister and I and our cousins didn't know anything about it, um, except that it had happened. So getting this journal, uh, finding this journal after my grandfather's death just felt like this huge gift. Um, obviously, I mean, not obviously, but I don't speak Dutch, so I couldn't read the Dutch version. But reading in English, I always knew my grandfather in English, like he, he married a British woman, raised his kids mostly in English, and he always spoke to us in English. And reading the English version of his journal was so, it was so amazingly like hearing his voice again, um, like his idiosyncrasies and stuff. And so it was like kind of getting to hear his voice again after his death, like this kind of beyond, you know, voice from beyond the grave. So it was amazing in that way as well as getting to know these details finally. And then I wanted to write something about it, but it took me quite a while to figure out what to write or what to do with it. And then I decided to take this trip um, where I would go to the same places he had gone and try to trace exactly his trip as closely as I could and go on the same dates that he had gone. So July 18th to, um, no, I can't remember, the 31st. And, um, and in 2015, the year that I ended up doing this trip, the days, the dates actually fell on the same days of the week that they had in 1942. So there was this really great symmetry. So I really liked that idea of having, you know, his travel journal and my travel journal interwoven somehow. And that was the idea going in. I didn't know exactly how it would work or like what I would write or how much of his journal and how much of mine I would include or anything like that. But that's how it started. Wow. That's you know, it's really amazing that something, uh, uh, something that bases a, a true story like the one that you have uh, uh, has this kind of origin to it. Um, now, you uh, have a selection from your book that you'd like to read today. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to read that now? Sure. Um, so I'm just going to read the beginning of the book. Okay. So it is, um, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just read the first few pages. The sky was full of humans and I was one of them. Way above the Atlantic Ocean, I exhaled and had no choice but to refill my lungs with air expelled from the inside, from inside the strangers crammed close around me. According to the digital map on the seat back in front of me, we were about halfway there. My nose began to tingle, and that could only mean one thing. I would grow a cystic pimple, a massive throbbing lump, right there, a millimeter above my right nostril. At 39, I was traveling alone for the first time, and my reasons for crossing the ocean seemed, from this vantage, murky at best. An attendant came by with his cart, and I asked for a coffee. Leaning my head back, I pressed the hot cardboard cup under my nose against the tingling spot, since heat often, often warded off cysts before they really got going. Oh, go away, painful nose, nose swelling, please go away. 
Soon I'd meet relatives I barely knew, and I'd face strangers for the rest of the month, not to mention Mateo. Hotter than optimal, painful really, and I didn't want to burn myself, had to get it just right. But I thought this is a particularly sensitive spot. That's why it hurts so much. Three minutes is usually good. How long has it been? Okay, three minutes starting now. I closed my eyes. There were approximately half a million humans in the sky at any given moment, traveling at hundreds of miles an hour. That's a million socks and a million shoes, not counting all the shoes and socks packed in a million suitcases. Arms and legs and human hair, each strand growing in its follicle. Bodies, bodies of people who died on holiday and whose remains must be buried at home. Bunnies and cages, cats and dogs, urine, germs, E. coli and HIV, and tumors and bed bugs. Three minutes, okay, I put the coffee cup down. Lingerie and parkas, I thought. Jeans and lipsticks, paper and ink, all just zooming through the sky, all day, every day. I touched the spot under my nose and the, sc and the skin didn't feel so good. When, my, when I made my way down the aisle to the toilet and looked in the mirror, the end and underside of my nose appeared, sure enough, an angry red, burnt. The rest of my face looked oily and yellowish and the special plain bathroom glow that seems a perfect embodiment of the urine and disinfectant smell that accompanies it. Even my eyes and hair were tinged with sickliness. I folded the door in toward me, stepped out of the bathroom, and scanned the scene before me. A grid of indistinct blue chair backs and lolling heads. This was why I had never traveled alone before, lost already on the plane. Breathing into my ribs to ease the stab of panic, I wandered the plane for at least 10 minutes, peering into each row for my new yellow headphones before I spotted them in the middle of a chair, my white notebook tucked into the mesh pocket with the magazines and puke bag. My row mates jostled to let me back in, and I sat for several minutes with the notebook gripped in both fists before opening it again. I felt like I had when I was 12, when I'd kept my navy blue diary tucked between my mattress and the wall, tucked it into my school bag each morning, checked for it throughout the day, reaching in to feel the comforting cloth cover against my palm. Inside the white notebook, I tucked my retyped and printed out pages of my grandfather's 73-year-old journal. It began. In the year of our Lord, 1942, when brute barbaric violence and injustice reigned over the greater part of Europe, I was one of the hundreds, if not thousands, who by a secret escape fled the violence and injustice which directly threatened their lives. What follows here is a short chronicle of that pilgrimage to safer places. Yas Van Emden had written these words long before he became a husband or a father or my opa. In July, 1942, now exactly 73 years ago, he was 33 years old. A young man, tall and blue eyed, his blonde curls styled into a meticulous side parted pompadour. His journal continued. It is, a it is merely a matter of fact travelogue from which few if any extraordinary or shocking events will be omitted. Let it be noted by way of an excuse that it is not my intention to compose something meant for publication. But now that I am here in the unoccupied part of France and have found, at least for now, a somewhat safe anchorage, I wanted to write down these facts for myself and possibly also for relatives and friends in this moment when all the peculiarities are still clear in my mind. So that later on, when we live again under happier and more humane circumstances, the memories of all this will not have faded completely. Yas's account covered two weeks during which he escaped from German occupied Europe. He'd been fired from his job at Royal Dutch Shell with the heartfelt regret of his Dutch employers. The new German government had passed laws barring him from working, from visiting movie theaters, from riding a bicycle or riding in a car or riding a tram unless on the front platform. He was forbidden from leaning out of windows or using balconies that faced the street or wearing clothing that had not been embossed with a yellow star reading Jew. 
On July 15th, exactly 73 years before I sat in that plane, all Amsterdam telephone subscribers were required to declare their race and anyone who admitted to being Jewish had their service cut off. Worse things were coming, there was no doubt. Opa's brother was going into hiding. His mother, already elderly, was sure no one could be bothered to track her down. I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Oh, I, I was really happy when you picked this, uh, this portion uh, for your selection to read, because I, I think it really speaks to how much of yourself you put into this book. Um, when, uh, when all said and done, how hard was it uh, to put so much of yourself on, onto the page? Um, well, you know, when I started this project, I really wanted it to be about my grandfather uh, more than about myself. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized how hard it was. I mean, I only knew my grandfather to an extent. Uh, he I was really young when he got sick with Alzheimer's and then he was sick for 10 years and then died. So, I mean, the last time he was kind of um, clear-minded and I was able to have a conversation with him, I was like 14 years old. And so, you know, I didn't know him that well. And he was not an easy person to know. No one knew him that well, really. Um, he wasn't the kind of adult that like really gets along well with children. So I didn't know him well and you can't really get to know someone in retrospect after they're gone is what I realized. Um, there wasn't really anyone around who did know him that well, including my mother. And so I had to, it, the story became more and more about me and I didn't, I was actually really resistant to that. I didn't like how my own personality and my own story was taking over, um, but it kind of happened by itself. And then, you know, as when I first was writing the book for the longest time, I had his whole journal in it, like the entirety of every journal entry. And every time I showed it to my peers who, you know, give me feedback on my work, my first readers, I guess, everyone I showed it to was like, take out, more of your grandfather's journal and put in more of yourself. And I was just so taken aback by that because I thought the whole point was his journal and that I would just kind of write around it. And it ended up being very different from that, that, you know, I had these excerpts from his journal, definitely not the whole thing. And I mean, I am definitely the protagonist or like, I mean, the kind of me, the Naomi character, because like there's obviously a difference between me and inevitably the narrator of this book, but that character is definitely the main character and the grandfather story is a supporting like a subplot i guess you could say yeah, yeah. you've uh, uh you you shared some uh photos um about uh your trip but also your opus uh journey mm -hmm. um, and you know so, some of uh, what you've just read uh is included in those photos. I wonder if we can switch to those now, uh, maybe starting off with uh, the escape map. Yeah, so the, the first photo is um, the map, a map that my grandfather drew that was actually with his journal that my parents found. And it shows, it, it's reproduced, not like a map that shows the same area, but not this exact drawing is in the book. Um, so this is my grandfather's actual drawing that shows his route. So you can see um, there's like a green line that shows where he went, um, starting in The Hague. So I actually started in Amsterdam, which is really close to The Hague and where my, my grandfather's and my relatives now live. But my grandfather was actually living outside of Amsterdam and closer to The Hague. So he left from there, for he left from that train station and went through Amsterdam. And then you can see he went across the border into Belgium and um, through Belgium and then through France or into France and then into Vichy, France where Leon was. Um, so, and then continued, there's a dotted line where he continued after the journal was over. Um, so when I took my trip, I went all the way to Leon, but I didn't include all of my trip in the book. So as you can, you can see that there's um, 
where the border between German occupied France and Vichy France, there's a dotted line. And that's where, that's the border that he had to get across that was very difficult to cross. Um, so there's a little town there called Montrechard that, and there's a river through it called the Cher. And he had to get across that river. And that was, that's kind of like the climax of his story, I guess you could say, is that he had to sneak across that river in the middle of the night and like wade through it with a huge crowd of other refugees. And then that once they were on the other side of that river, he was more or less like, as he would say, provisionally safe, very temporarily, and like definitely not for sure. But uh, that's where I ended my story was once I had crossed that river, like he had done. That's where my book ends, is like right on the other side of that dotted line, um, on the other side of that river. And you can also see there's a point where um, he got to Paris and he went all the way to, to Dijon and then to a town called Chalon and then doubled back to Paris because he was hoping to get across the border there and he couldn't. I'm pointing to it as though you can see where I'm pointing, but. <laughs> um, and then doubled back to Paris because he couldn't get across the border there and had to try a different route. So when I followed his trip, I, I also did that because I did everything he did. So I went to Dijon all the way to this little town, Chalon, and then doubled back to Paris. That's that's quite the journey. Um, on on your next uh, picture, I, I think this is the excerpt from the journal. Yeah. So the next picture, I just gave you the first page of my grandfather's actual journal, the English version of it, obviously. And so um, you can see how he typed it and then kind of made notes on it in handwriting. So it was a bit of a like a job to. Uh, transcribe it and that was the first thing I did when my parents sent it to me because I was like well what am I I wanted to do something so I transcribed the whole thing and then so emailed it to all my all our relatives because I thought I don't know at least it was something helpful <laughs> so but yeah all through it he's like crossed things out and rewritten it and pen and stuff so it's kind of neat to be able to to see that when there were even I didn't I didn't send you this but there were whole pages at certain points that were handwritten instead of typed and stuff like that so yeah. It, I think it's really important that families keep track of that kind of thing. Like just for, for memory's sake, it's, it's amazing that he did that. Um, your next photo is your opa as, as a younger man. Yeah, so here um, is a photo of my grandfather with his parents and his brother. So my grandfather is the one sitting in front. Um, and you can see it says August, 1923. His family was like fairly well to do, as you can see. And um, they're hiking in like very interesting outfits. <laughs> Part of what I love about this photo is like their idea of appropriate mountain climbing outfits. <laughs> um, and that's his brother standing up, of course, and his parents. So you know, it's, it's pretty poignant, this photo for me, partly because in his journal, he refers back to all these family holidays that they'd go on and like they'd go on these walking tours as a family. Yeah. And when he was on this train trip, he was passing through places where he'd gone before on holidays. So like an, a very different, a very different kind of traveling, like, obviously with his family. And now he's separated from his family. His brother um, like went into hiding, like I, I said, in his own house, his father had already died when the war started. And his mother ended up um, being, when he got back to Holland after the war, he, his mother was gone and he eventually learned that she'd been arrested and died in a concentration camp. So, um, and that was kind of the shadow that remained over him for the rest of his life. And I think was always the reason that I was given why, like he didn't want to talk about this time at all. So there's something very, like, I don't know, obviously sad and poignant and about the fact that here these people are enjoying life and being kind of um, having a really, really good life and things are gonna not stay that way. Um, That's been very heartbreaking for him to be going back through all these places he had spent such happy times. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, heartbreaking, yes and no. Like he, he writes about how he kind of was emotionally numb at that time, but I think, Yes, like 
on some level, obviously it was heartbreaking. And, um, and then the next photo I included is his passport, my grandfather's passport from 1945. And I just really uh, love this photo of him. He was so dashing. <laughs> Um, this is, and this is around the time my mother was born and my grandparents had just gotten together not long before that really and this photo of him is included in my book like between all the chapters sorry you were saying Dave sorry I, I, did, I didn't mean to interrupt Naomi I, I apologize no. um, so this is the passport uh, post escape this yeah is, this is him in England at this point right yeah and I mean this was a 1945 so that's when the war ended that year, but you can see like he was in the military at that point. He went on to England and joined the army. So you can see he's, I think he's in uniform in that photo. And there were, there were other brighter days for him as well. And the next photo is his wedding picture. Yeah, so uh, this is my grandparents um, getting married and their wedding cake. They had a very small, uh, like just the two of them and a couple of witnesses kind of wedding and you can see well they were both in the military at that point so I think they got married in 1943 um so they were yeah there they are um in England in London which is where they met my grandmother was British and um like I said was like 15 years younger so he was about 30 six and she was 21 at that point I think oh it's certainly a beautiful picture mm -hmm. yeah the next one is not from your grandfather's time no so these are like I was like I wonder what that means but it is it, licorice tits are indeed licorice tits they're naked breasts made of licorice um and in Amsterdam you see a lot of licorice and a lot of naked breasts so this i guess combines two passions of the uh <laughs> the city um my mother always told me about like the licorice that they ate when they were kids and um like in amsterdam and they'd eat a lot like they'd eat like salt licorice which is i'd never had and i tried for the first time when i was there so I, anyway i took a picture of this just because it was funny <laughs> Um, and then the next one is the Cher River. So I don't, like, I'm not a big photographer. I did not take a lot of photos on my trip, but I did take photos here. So this is, like, at the point where I was crossing the river that my grandfather crossed. I crossed it on a bridge. I didn't, like, wade and swim across it like he did. Um, I just walked across, but on the same date. So um, this is that river. And, I mean... I was surprised by, it's a very narrow river. It's not like a raging wide body of water. And there's like this sweet little countryside along each side. So it's, it's, it's to me, that was just such a, I don't know, interesting contrast with the, the drama of the moment that he was going through. And, uh, and I have two more photos of that river. Here I am when I was in the middle of the bridge, looking back towards um, the town of Montrichard, which was in German-occupied France in 1942. It's very beautiful, as you can see. And the hotel I stayed in was just like yards away from um, this bridge. And then looking ahead to what was then free France. So very little narrow border there that river made. Yeah. And then the next photo is a pub that I saw on the other side called, so this is all, like actually on the bridge, but almost to the other side called Le Passeur. And that's what the people were called who helped um, Jews and other refugees out of um, across the border there. They were called Passeurs. And there was like, I mean, some people were obviously doing it out of altruism. There's also kind of a darker history there that people were doing it obviously for money. And um, in some cases, unfortunately, really screwing people over. Like my grandfather wrote about how um, there were people who were in this business, if you can call it that, who would, you know, collect enormous amounts of money and then not follow through, like not show up or even um, like, what's the word, like turn people in. So you're taking a big risk, just trusting anybody and, 
luckily he, my grandfather all along the way managed to trust the right people. Um, usually it was people that he knew somehow or were friends of friends, but in this case, yeah, in this case, he, it was kind of word of mouth. Like he would meet someone they'd introduce, or he would know someone they'd introduce him to someone they'd introduce him to someone. Um, um, anyway, so I, I can, I tried to find this pub online and find some history of it. And like, there's no mention of a connection with the pastors who were, who helped people out of German occupied France um, during the second world war. But I, that must be what the pub is named after. And, you know, I wrote about in my book, like the movie back to the future and um, that kind of going back and forth in time and, this was to me was like such a back to the future moment that pub being there, like kind of like the Lone Pine Mall, you know, <laughs> like, like in my mind, I was going back and forth between my grandfather crossing this river and me crossing this river. And here he is trudging through the river in the middle of the night with the pastor. And then here's the pastor pub, you know. Um, these have been some wonderful pictures. Thank you very much for sharing them with us. Oh, uh, of course. Should uh, I sorry uh with with the really personal connection here did you did you find yourself under uh, uh any self-imposed pressure while you were writing this um while i was writing like pressure what do you mean uh it, it, did you find yourself uh being any uh uh uh, harder on yourself to, to make sure that you get this one right. Uh, oh, the, the um, connection that you have, wanting to make sure that every every uh, element is right, you, that you capture every moment. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, when I was traveling, I definitely felt some pressure to have a trip or a journey worth writing about because I wanted it to be a book, and that's kind of a weird thing to have in your mind when you're doing something like this has to be worthy of writing about because I want to write about it and in a lot of ways it wasn't worthy of writing about it was just sitting on trains and um I mean my grandfather spent most of those two weeks sitting on trains and he even writes about how and I mean this is something we can all relate to now I think is how sometimes it's more stressful having to wait around doing nothing than to actually take action and um the and that's what he was doing a lot of the time. Like he was bored and very, very stressed at the same time. And like, as we're experiencing now in this like pandemic, being bored and scared at the same time is like a terrible situation. Yeah. Um, I think he, um, but yeah, because I was doing exactly what he did. It was, it was kind of boring. Like I'm just sitting there on a train for days and days and days and every now and then I get to like have a bit of time to walk around somewhere, like meet people, relatives and stuff, but not that often. So I ended up writing more, like using the trip as a frame and writing around it more about other memories um, and of my grandparents and of other things that were connected to the theme kind of of Jewish identity for myself. But, um, like in terms of pressure, like I, I don't think, like to once I kind of accepted that this book was more about me than about anything about my grandfather, then like that pressure wasn't wasn't there. Like I stopped, I did have to stop worrying. Like what are, what are, what's my family gonna think? Like what are my grandfather's other relatives gonna think? Like am I, um, because and and I had like I was aware that like my relatives knew I was writing something and that they were expecting it to be like about my grandfather and so I definitely felt like oh no they're gonna think like what did you do you wrote this like weird book about yourself instead of writing about Opa. but um I just kind of had to let that go and then once I managed to stop thinking about that then it's just no I mean yeah I wanted it to be good but no more than anything else I've written other than the traveling aspect of it uh, how is this book different than writing a, a piece of fiction? Um, well, I mean, in a way it's easier because you don't have to make stuff up, you know, like when, <laughs> like Fair writing point. fiction is so hard because you're just starting from nothing and you have to build this whole world and then find a story inside that world. 
And with nonfiction, you don't have to build the world. You just have to find the story in the world that's already there. So in that way, it's a lot easier. Um, you know, there's less room to like move things around and play with things. Like you don't want to like cross that line into fiction and then, you know, not be telling the truth anymore. And I mean, that is a blurry line that different people who write memoirs, you know, put in different places, but um and then in other ways, it's remarkably similar because it's really about making sure that everything in the book is about the same thing in some way and that everything is connected and that it follows, you know, there's a satisfying chain of events that build up to something that means something. So, I mean, it's still storytelling and it works basically the same way. I, I, I mean, but then, sorry, I guess. Maybe this is what you're asking too, is like on an emotional level, it's harder. Like, obviously you're exposing yourself um, and you're not, you know, pretend like pretending that it's fiction. Not that my fiction is not fiction because it is, but you know, like there's no like claim that this didn't happen. You're saying like, this is me. This is like, not just what I, what I did or what happened to me, but also this is how I think. And like, if you don't like this book, it's, you probably don't like me because this is me, you know? Um, but then I feel like that is not nearly as scary as it would seem because the more I worked on it, the more it just felt like, um, like a, an object, like a thing that I was shaping and that I wanted it to have the best shape it could have. And it was less about me and more about the book as an object outside I me. Mean, the story is a, as an entity outside me. And so. There's almost a dissociation. Yeah. So you can write about yourself uh, and still be you, but let your character be your character, even though yeah. it's you. And I mean, it's funny because then people definitely, you know, read it and think, oh, well that, or people who don't know me read it and are like, well, now I know you. And it's like, well, yes and no like I, it's definitely a version of me right like you can't really put your whole self I mean it's impossible to put your <clears throat> your whole self in a book it's you kind of have to make a character out of yourself that's a lot simpler than a real person um but yeah I was gonna say something else and I forget what it was oh yeah like sometimes people do like I look on Goodreads and there's reviews on there they're like I hate this book. This woman is just a whiny narcissist or whatever, or like whatever the criticism is. I'm like, okay, so probably if we met, you wouldn't like me and I probably wouldn't like you either. And like, that's fine. You know, like I don't have to get along with everybody. I mean, it's just interesting. I don't care. Like I'm not upset about it. It's it just, it's par for the course that some people are not going to dig it. And they probably wouldn't like the books and movies and other you know, the stories that have, and the writing that's inspired me and that I like, have because, you know, like obviously in a memoir, you're not just drawing from life, you're drawing from everything you've read. And like what, like for me, a lot of it is like what I find funny, like, because like, I always have some element of humor in my writing. And it's like, well, you probably wouldn't find the things that I find funny, funny, if you don't find this funny, you know? So. so uh, yeah. I want to, a lot of your other works are uh, are fiction. Um, I, I've really enjoyed uh, reading your short stories in, in preparation for this talk. Oh, thanks. Um, I, I've I've heard you say in other interviews that you really enjoy writing short stories. What about short stories? Do you like to to write? Um, I like how compact they are. That you know, you're not stuck in it for like years toiling away and getting incredibly sick of it and wishing you'd never started <laughs> which is what happens inevitably with the whole book um and they they require less not less structure but like a simpler structure and they require less um of a kind of sense of resolution and a plot line, which, and I, I find that kind of the, the narrative arc that is required in a book like work, especially a fiction, like in a novel. And I love novels and I'm attempting to write one now, um, but they require like a bit more artifice, this kind of artificial rise and fall of action and like everything leading to something 
satisfying in an explosive kind of way. And um, short stories, you don't really have to do that, not to the same extent. And so I feel like short stories can actually be more, it can be closer to what life is really like than a novel. So uh, one of your short stories, Attachment, um, we, we were planning on doing uh, an excerpt from this, but I see we're uh, running close on time. Um, so uh, that, sh that short story uh, clocks in at about 80 pages. It might be the longest short story I've ever read. Um, it, I, it's uh, certainly the longest uh, job application. Uh, <laughs> Um, can, can you tell, can you tell us a little bit about that short story? Yeah, sure. So attachment is, um, the last story in this book. I know who you remind me of. I'm just showing it to you because I love the cover. I always, when I was a kid, I was obsessed with someday becoming an astronaut, which obviously didn't happen. So this is the closest I'm ever going to get. <laughs> you have your copy on your end. I have my copy on my end. Oh, good. <laughs> um, and so this story, it's called Attachment because the whole thing is an email attachment. And to be honest, I'm not crazy about that title anymore. At the time, it seems super awesome and clever to me. But um, so it's set in 2020, which was the future when I wrote this. <laughs> and, goodness, it's turned out differently from how I expected. But anyway, um, this book was published in 2012. And this story, yeah, it's about 90 pages. So it's like, you could call it a novella or like a long short story. And it's, um, it started out as a, I was trying to write a novel and it was like 300 pages and it wasn't working at all. And then while I was avoiding writing my novel, I would like write short stories. And then at some point I realized I had enough short stories for a book. And then I realized that I could turn this like really bad 300 page novel into like a 90 page story that I really liked. So that's how, that's how this book came about um, and this story. And yeah, so it end, I ended up writing it as like one long job application. So my character, my protagonist, Bonnie is applying for a job. Um, and the first couple of pages are just a cover letter and her resume and then, and like her email to this woman, the CEO of a company called um, Bottle Rocket Soda Pop Corporation. So maybe I'll just read you. I'm just trying to think if I should read the cover letter before I read the notes. Start. So yeah, so it's a cover letter, a resume, and then notes and the notes go on for like for 90 pages so yeah, yeah. it's a it's a very not well, pardon the pun it's a novel way to write a story um <laughs> it's uh I, I love the structure to it um the uh I, I don't know that we'll have time to actually do the uh, uh the excerpt but oh okay uh, I didn't know they're running late um the uh, the story itself kind of centers around uh, it's almost a tongue tongue in cheek look at a sibling rival rivalry and one yeah. sister's attempt to uh, one up uh, her her sister. Yeah, uh, the novel I was writing was all about this family and this yeah this like intense sibling rivalry and like there's also a brother who's kind of caught between the sisters and just kind of a like a hapless bystander. Um, Almost and, like a string in a game of tug of war. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's kind of the, yeah, he's the the rope in the tub of tug of war. But um, like I had this story, but I didn't have the structure of the cover letter and the whole thing about the job that she's applying for is kind of what I came up with at the end to tie it to like to bring it together somehow. Mm. So that was the last thing I thought of. But yeah, it's, it's about sibling rivalry and the, the sister, Bonnie, the protagonist of the narrator is applying for a job skydiving from space in or as like a publicity stunt for this soda pop company. Mm. And like while I was writing it, it was like there was a, like one or two articles that I'd read about 
um, Red Bull and how they were having this similar stunt or planning a similar stunt. And then after my book was published, it actually, they actually did it. So it was kind of neat to watch the actual skydive from space after I'd written the story. Yeah, I, I've seen that video. It, it is amazing. It's insane. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that that uh, short story kind of has uh, a, a lot of questions around identity and around uh, you know a person's self identity compared to how other people see them and uh, how they remember things compared to how other people remember things. And that mm -hmm. that seems to be a common theme in, in uh, you know also your novel Cricket in a Fist uh, and. Um, you know, in, in several of your other works, um, what what keeps bringing you back to this idea of uh, identity and memory and how we see ourselves? Um, I don't know. Like, I kind of tend to think it's a universal concern, or should be. <laughs> like, it's it's very mind boggling when you start to realize that you remember things completely differently from other people. Um, with whom you thought you had shared experiences. And I guess, you know, at some point in my life, I realized that this is the case. And since then, it's just kind of been and a, a bit of a preoccupation, um, like with how misunderstand, how many, how much is based on misunderstandings, how often we think that we have a shared history or a shared narrative with someone. And then it turns out that that's not how they experienced it or remember it at all. Um, that, you know, unless you're constantly trying, communicating with people and trying to make sure you're on the same page, you're probably not. And then, you know, I think maybe, yeah, like even as a kid, I really noticed this happening a lot, which was like that I thought things had happened a certain way and then other people in my family would kind of have a different version of it. And it kind of, it just was like, I was it's just something that I was always trying to figure out and that is very disturbing, has been very disturbing to me that, you know, you feel like you're connecting with people and having, yeah, shared experiences. And it's like, well, how, to what extent is it even possible to have a shared experience if you end up taking completely different things away from it, interpreting it differently and even remembering it differently. So, yeah. There's certainly a lot of up to unpack there in terms of uh, uh, ideas for stories and, um, as long as there's more than two people there, there's a chance that somebody is going to see something different from somebody else. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting topic. Um, I, I, I'm getting some questions up on my feed here uh, from our audience. Uh, the first question we have is, did you get the blessing of your relatives who are mentioned in, uh, in the book? And I, I assume they're talking about tiny lights here. Um, so did you get, did you get the blessing of, uh, your relatives, uh, for tiny lights? Um, yes and no. I, I kind of like some people, I told them I was writing it. I didn't ask permission. Um, I, 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 I mean, permission, yeah. <laughs> pardon? I, I say forgiveness is always easier than permission. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of what I, the principle I was going with. <laughs> but I mean, honestly, I did kind of. Like what I just said about remembering things differently was like a real guiding principle for me writing this book. And, and it's also what I, I put in my, you know, at the end of the book is a kind of um, caveat um, or a disclaimer. And like I told my family, I'm writing this, but, you know, I know that I'm going to remember things differently from you and we all remember them differently. And this is, you know, my story and my memories, my interpretation. And like, I don't expect it to represent anybody else's experience except for mine. And so um, because of that, like, I didn't, I didn't want to check and say, you know, it's not a document, uh, a journalistic document or, or something like that, where I felt like I needed to fact check and say, like, is this what happened? Is this what you remember? I mean, I obviously wanted to get dates and stuff, right. But um ultimately it's my story and I I changed almost all of the names of the people in this story kind of as a way partly as a way just of reminding myself like this is my version of that person inevitably and it's not like I've captured them and like stuck them to a page you know so basically no I did not get them <laughs> <laughs> fair enough <laughs> 
Um, our, our next question is: In your fiction work, do you find your characters, or do the story or the stories around them develop in your imagination first? Oh yeah, that's, uh, definitely characters come first for me. Yeah, like I can kind of like sometimes really picture the characters for a long time, and I don't even know what to do with them. Like I have to takes a lot more effort and time to figure out what their story is for mm -hmm. sure. Um, our next question, any surprising discoveries about yourself as you went through the journey of writing the story about your grandfather? Um, like surprising discoveries, I don't know. Um, and, and that's a hard one to answer. I'm not, I'm not sure, to be honest. Like it's such a, we're always discovering things about ourselves, but uh, I mean, and, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and it was very much a journey of self-discovery for you at the same time, right? So. I mean, uh, yeah. So during that time, a lot of things in my life were changing. Like I, I, my marriage that I was in ended and um, started a new relationship. And I, I wrote about that in the book, like the end of one relationship and the beginning of another one. And um, like the kind of self-examination that comes with, you know, life not like suddenly not going in the direction that you expected and, and like those opportunities. I mean, cause it ends up being a kind of opportunity to like rewrite your story and your future. So um, I was definitely doing that. Yeah, that was a very worthwhile activity. Um, and you know, in, uh, in your book, it's, uh, you know, it, you, you lay you lay that journey out so well, um, and, and what you're going through at the time, and you know your your, your thoughts and, and your process of working through uh, different things, and, and again those ties to identity and the uh, the issues that you were having with identity at the same time. Um, yeah, so to me, it's all about that. Like, and I really tried to make sure that everything in the book was about that. Really, um, like, it's not a book about like the end of one relationship and the beginning of the other. Like, that is in there, but it's more about. I mean, I tried to really focus on that question of like identity and I'd really been, you know, struggling with that. Like my grandfather was Jewish, but like did not identify as Jewish at all. And yet was had, you know, his life was radically altered by what happened to him as a result of being Jewish. And then and my father's Jewish, my mother's half Jewish and, and, um, my sister and I were grew up like very confused about whether we were Jewish or not and what that meant. So, and then like my, you know, that was an issue in my marriage to someone who was like much more observant and like very much identifies as a Jew as a Jew. And, and so anyway, so like that question was really big in my mind. And that's definitely what everything in the book was about. And like, I guess like what I learned about myself was that I could be comfortable with my identity as sort of Jewish and <laughs> that I didn't have to like keep feeling like I was changing my mind or trying to figure it out. Like, I feel like I'm pretty solid and like who I am in that respect, um, which I did not feel like before. And so, yeah, I mean, I definitely, that is definitely a change for me. And as self-discovery goes, that's a huge one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, also, it's not just writing the book, but it's having written it that, you know, people who've read it and who talk to me, like even people I already knew um, and people I didn't already know have told me, you know, I really relate to this, like being kind of Jewish thing and like having one Jewish parent and one not, or being like, a hundred percent like ethnically Jewish, but raised totally secular. Um, and then feeling guilty when other more observant Jews like are like, well, why don't you, why aren't you more observant or why don't you know this and this? And, um, and like, I, I guess just realizing there's so many other people that experience, cause I'd always felt kind of isolated by, with my sister, at least, um, in this like particular, ambiguity and then so all these other people having that as well is like oh this is there's a lot of people with this experience so that's you know comforting yeah 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 well uh thank you very much naomi uh for for joining us here today um 
we really appreciated your time today. We, we, we thank you for uh, agreeing to join us uh, and participate. Uh, I, I've enjoyed working with you to prepare for today. I've enjoyed reading your work in preparation for today. Uh, we wish you the best of luck with your recent nominations. Um, and I'm excited to read your next book. Thank you so much, Dave. Yeah. Um, and to all our viewers today, thank you so much. Um, it, it's great that we had uh, so many people uh, attend our virtual talk. Part of me is quite sad that we didn't get to do this in person. Uh, but I am I am happy that uh, as many were able to view as uh, as there were today. Uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and make sure to su subscribe to our channel. Remember uh, to click the bell uh, on the YouTube page to be notified of our upcoming PL talks. Uh, information on where to buy Naomi's book is found in the YouTube video description information below. Uh, as is information on how to join our mailing list to get news about future PL talks. Thank you, everyone. I, I thank you for your time and your attention. Stay safe, and I hope to. I hope that you will join us for our next installment of PL talks. Take care. <laughs>